We're very fortunate today to um, have several excellent speakers. Uh, first will be Michael DeChalice, who is a, a food system consultant and has been working to have the first savory hub in Montana in Chico. Uh, following that, we will hear from Linda Poole. Linda is at the uh, National Center for Appropriate Technologies Regenerative Grazing Specialist, and she oversees NCAT's Water for Soil Project and has an extensive background across the, the uh, range, I'm sorry, in monitoring range health, assessing wildlife populations, and in facilitating con conservation collaborations. Uh, following that, we'll hear from Marnie Thompson, who's an area planner for USDA NRCS and a uh, member of the Soil and Water Conservation Society and Cole Mannix. And Cole's from a family that's been ranching since 1882. Uh, and he is now a, a founder and manager of the Old Fox Co-op and they will tell us about the Montana Soil Outreach Project. If we'll have time at the end for questions, but also if you have a question for a particular speaker as they're as they're talking in the finish and feel free to to raise your hand or put it in the chat and with that i'll turn it over to michael all right can you all hear me yep great awesome so okay. hi um i'm michael the cellist um i also i work with arrow on the mfei project but today i am wearing a different hat um, i'm here representing the we are for the land foundation which is based in paradise valley montana um, caveat, this is the first time that I'm really giving this spiel outside of our close team. So thank you for giving me some grace on that. And I'm, I'm really interested in uh, hearing your clarifying questions and feedback on, on this um, after I've shared. So We Are for the Land Foundation is a nonprofit which is fiscally sponsored through Western Sustainability Exchange. And we're working to create a holistically managed demonstration farm and ranch down in Paradise Valley, um, right outside of Chico Hot Springs. So right now, um, our We Are For The Land Foundation exists to create interest and connection to land and food in order to ensure the healthiest planet for future generations. So our goal is to have a demonstration site that is a place for nature-based discovering connection to local food, agricultural, and ecology by modeling holistic agricultural practices and nutrient-dense food production while regenerating the land and increasing soil health. Um, we wanna offer experiential educational programming and events the opportunity for outcome-based research and innovation, and we wanna share stories of the legacy and future of this land. So the recent history of this land that I'm referring to is that Colin Davis, who's the owner of Chico Hot Springs, bought about 600 acres of land right up the hill from Chico. So if you've ever been up to Chico, it's like right up by the spa, um, and it's just kind of up there on that top region. Um, before, and this is about six years ago, um, Historically, this is part of a migration path for Crow, Cheyenne, and Salish tribes coming through the valley. It was most likely grazed about 25 years ago. Um, that was the last time there was any livestock there. And then about seven years ago, it was slated to become a golf course. But fortunately, that fell through. And Colin bought the property with the intention of protecting it from further development. So far, some of that acreage has gone to the Yellowstone Film Ranch. And then in about 2019, um, Chico employees, Andrew Doolittle, Michelle Shifley, started up a conversation with Megan Lannon, um, who's a rancher in Paradise Valley from Barney Creek Livestock, and they started talking about what we could possibly do with some of this land. So many, many conversations later um, with Colin, uh, they decided they wanted to develop a holistically managed demonstration site and education space on about, about 10 acres of land there, and then uh, have livestock grazing on about 200 of the acres um, right outside the center. So we're exploring the demonstration site, having interpretive trails that go through the grazing pasture, a nature playground, um, and then having some education, uh, outdoor education space there. However, the soil is terrible <laughs> right now. So we really need to start to rebuild this before we can even start grazing. Um, in these conversations, we've had um, a lot of interest in, in providing an experience for consumers. We know there's a lot of organizations that are doing wonderful education for farmers and ranchers, and we really wanted to um, figure out a way to help connect consumers to 
um, and, and help them understand their role in supporting health, healthy ecosystems and how they can support producers who are doing that work as well. There's about 800,000 people who enter Yellowstone through the North entrance and they all come through the Paradise Valley. Um, so we think that we can really capitalize on tourism in this area and bring people in to make those connections. Um, so with this concept in mind, uh, we have some initial funding from Patagonia to explore this, this idea further. And this funded initial research and connections to develop some concepts of what this could be. Um, it was at this point in February 2021 that I came in as project manager and uh, program development based on my background in food systems and farm to school education. We also formed an incredible board of directors and we began that fiscal sponsorship with, uh, with Western Sustainability Exchange. We also had some initial funding through the Park County Community Foundation. So once we defined a little bit more about what we wanted to do, our group decided to look at other folks who might in the country and the world who are doing some work similar to ours. So we immediately found um, Tomcat Ranch and Pisces Ranch out in California. And we also found uh, White Oak Pastures in Georgia. And we saw that White Oak Pastures was a savory institute hub. And so we started to look into what that actually meant. Um, so the Savory Institute is an international nonprofit guided by Alan Savory, and their mission is to facilitate the large scale regeneration of the world's grasslands and the livelihoods of their inhabitants through holistic management. And they do this by offering education and connection around holistic management and through their hub network. So currently there's about 43 hubs across the world, and there's about 15, maybe 20 um, in development currently. So that is one of our hubs. Right now we're, we're calling ourselves the Montana Savory Influencer Hub, but this may change as time goes on. Um, and so we are, we are in an 18 month process to become online as a hub with them. So being a hub means that we seek to promote awareness about the Savory Institute and holistic agriculture in our region. Um, we went through an extensive application process. We have a really fun little video that I can share. Um, and Megan Landon and I have been part <laughs> have been part of the Hub Design Lab for the past past six months with seven other upcoming hubs. So there's going to be a hub in Kansas, one's in Ecuador, one's in Turkey, one's in Chile, one's in Brazil, and one's in Israel. Um, this has been an incredible experience to network with these other international hubs, and we've received incredible training from the Savory Institute instructors and some of their partners. Um, we've been learning together to develop a business and organizational model for our hub, as well as defining our holistic context and our whole under management. We're also looking at what it might be like to bring um, Savory's ecological outcome ver verification services and their land to market programs to our area. So EOV is a protocol for monitoring land health. It gives a holistic look at both leading and lagging indicators on the land. And the land to market is the first, first verified regenerative uh, sourcing solution for meat, dairy, wool, and leather, and it helps connect producers to businesses and consumers who are interested in either developing products or buying from regenerative, regeneratively managed animals. So if we, if we decide to take that path, our hub could potentially act as a verifier for producers in our area who are interested in taking advantage of these programs. So this is the Savory Institute part of our work. Um, we also have joined with Open Team as a hub, and Open Team is founded by Wolf's Neck Center for Food and the Environment in Freeport, Maine. Um, Open Team stands for Open Technology Ecosystem for Agricultural Management, um, and it's a farmer-driven interoperable suite of tools that provides farmers around the world with the best possible knowledge to improve soil health. Um, and so and as an Open Team hub, will serve as a primary testing ground um, through field testing for their Open Team platform. And our experience and feedback will help inform Open Team's user interface design and calibration of tools that are part of their platform. Um, so those are our two kind of big hub, hub opportunities that we are exploring and are going to make happen soon. Um, we also just applied for a Western SARE grant. Um, the project's called Buzz on the Range. And the idea here is to directly support producers in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem specifically and in Southwest Montana who are interested in deepening their understanding of soil health, water cycle, alternative approach to um, native grass dispersal and growth and pollinator communities. And so we'll share and exhibit to producers several monitoring and testing techniques to illustrate the benefits of maximizing inputs for profitability and land health. 
Um, having more data like this will hopefully allow producers to increase their productivity of their grazing lands and decrease inputs and management. So we have five incredible producers in the Yellowstone Valley ecosystem who've, who've agreed to join us if we get this grant. Um, and we have some incredible research and community partners through MSU Extension Forage, um, MSU's Dan Scott uh, Ranch Management Program, the NRDC, WSC, the DNRC, and this, site, this grant would allow us to start building out this uh, demonstration site and allow us to kind of further pro progress our hub um, status within a savory and open team. So this is where we are right now. We're kind of in this huge mega idea generation and we're trying to figure out how we're getting, getting from point A to point Z. Uh, we're working on developing social media presence, a website and communication materials. We're really interested in other research partnerships. So I'm super curious to hear from everyone else on this call and see if there's ways that we can support each other in our work. Um, we're interested in having thought partnership conversations if folks have ideas or suggestions for us as we develop as, in this hub model. Um, and we're always interested in funding connections and, and grant suggestions that, that you might feel like is a match for our work. Um, I know this wasn't really about soil health in particular, but it definitely was about community. Um, and how we hope we can bring more community into our soil health project. Um, this project would not exist without our community partnerships. So that is what I have. Um, love to hear clarifying questions or feedback on any of the things that I've talked about. Michael, would you mind sharing a link in the chat to the, the video you talked about? Um, yes, yes, I definitely will. I can do that. Second to get it. So, any questions for, for um, Michael at this point? There'll be opportunities later too, but the, uh, any questions at this point? Robin? I have a question. Um, in our, I, just amazing, Michael, just extraordinary. Uh, I, I'm so thrilled with all this being explored. And did I understand at one point you were looking into a cooperative structure, or did I make that up? We we could. We did look at that route here. Um, we don't have a lot of producers in this area. And so we were, were not exactly sure what that would look like. I think as we develop, that would definitely be a conversation that we could absolutely have and would be interesting having. Um, we, I talked a lot with uh, Michael McCormick um, who runs the Livingston Food Resource Center, and he had looked into doing a hub uh, for a while as well, and then just decided that there was a lot of um, kind of barriers to entry, if you will, in this area for creating um, a food, a co-op. Yeah. Good question, Robin. I see Richard with a hand up. Do you have a question? Uh, yeah. Hi, hi Michael. Uh, so, so this is great. This is perfect timing. I heard that there was a uh, savory hub launching somewhere in Montana through the rumor mill on this. And, uh, and so, so it's great to find out where this is happening. Um, uh, it, it's also really interesting that you're just right at the nascent stage of, of establishing a hub. And, uh, and I'm wondering if, if there's any plan on on baselining the current carbon uh, carbon uh, soil uh, content of the uh, did I get this right? About 200 acres is going to be is going to be uh, holistically managed, mm -hmm. and and so are you establishing the it, the current carbon uh, soil content, uh, and then and then how will you measure? And then measuring that as you go forward, potentially participating in carbon offset markets, uh, carbon future markets and things like that. Is that part of the plan? Yes, it's just not well defined yet. So we are working with Western Sustainability Exchange and that's something that they are really interested in. Um, and we have um, a couple of other partners that we are starting to have conversations with about what it would look like for us to do um, that kind of information gathering. Um, so uh -huh. stay tuned. I'd love to get back to you. Um, I think that's kind of up next for us in terms of some grant funding that we're looking at is directly related to that. 
but we don't have a full plan put in place for it. But it's something we definitely we would like to explore. Yeah, I'd love to talk to you about that. I work for, uh, I've gotten to know a number of people that are on the call here now. And uh, so I work for the, I live in Hamilton, Montana, I work for UC Irvine, and, and we have a research group we're putting together to do, to develop remote sensing and Nice. And, and even local scale kind of drone type uh, hyperspectral imaging to do this kind of work at a real detailed level. And uh, the timing might be really good, uh, you know, as you're becoming a savory hub mm -hmm. uh, for some opportunities. So I yeah. Yeah. chatted yeah. my email, we'll talk some more. Thanks. Perfect. Yeah, I love that. Thank you so much. Um, I actually, I immediately want to put you in touch with my husband who's running the open team relationship. He is a robotics design engineer and he is all about the data and loves the drone and like the remote sensing. So he would. Great. I need him for another project. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Wonderful. Collaboration at its finest. Love it. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks, Michael. And we'll come back. Let's, let's, uh, uh, move on and the uh, so Linda, if you want to tell us about the uh, NCAT water tutorial project. Sure, I would love to do that. Can you see my screen? We can. That's great. Good. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to participate today. Arrow is one of those organizations that has been a hero to me for a long time. Um, a lot of the early ideas that I used um, in designing my own little place here came from Arrow. So it's a, it's an honor to be here. I feel like I'm kind of among giants. I, uh, I love the Lentil Underground and, and the books that Liz Carlisle has written. Um, so anyway, I feel like I'm in among heroes. Uh, you probably, um, with the history that Arrow has being so similar to the history of NCAT, I don't want to waste too much of your time with the background of the National Center for Appropriate Technology. So the high level view is that we've been around for 45 years now, and our mission is helping people build resilient communities through local and sustainable solutions that reduce poverty, strengthen self-reliance and protect natural resources. And so why would we be thinking about something called soil for water? And uh, especially in Montana, this is a nationwide program now. Um, and in each of the states, there's a state lead. And I'm really happy to be the one here in Montana because what it does is it brings together my background. I, I ranch, I've had cattle or sheep all my life, I have a little bunch now, significantly fewer, thank you to the drought, but still hanging in there. And I'm a wildlife biologist. I worked for the Nature Conservancy for 20 years at the intersection of ranching, conservation, and communities. And we feel like to meet our mission as NCAT in Montana, we need a program like Soil for Water. And you know, this is this is the year, this is the time to really be talking about why that is important. Let's see if I can get this thing to move. There we go. So the Soil for Water program started out of the big drought, the 2010 to 2015 drought in Texas. And we had pretty strong staff down there. And that was a killer. It was a killer of businesses. It was a killer of hope. It was a killer of livestock. Um, this one that we're going through in Montana right now is no fun either. And the NCAT approach to doing a lot of these things is to start by listening. And what we heard in Texas was, was that uh, they didn't want to be victims. They weren't victims. They wanted to know what it was that they could do about drought. And what they realized is if we can catch every drop and put it to work, that we have a chance to make it through this. And even in good years, we have a chance to be much more profitable. And we're hearing the same thing here in Montana. I've worked with Dale Viseth um, quite a little bit. And he makes the point that no matter how bad it gets, 
there are specific things that can be done that can help ranches be sustainable over the long haul. And so what the Soil for Water program is about is helping people understand how to get that done. Let me see if I can get this out of the way. What we understand is that saving water and soil is a powerful, underused, low-cost method of water conservation. Um, you already have the water that falls on your land. If you can keep it there, that's, that's going to get you ahead. And it's also, at least for many of us now, one of the most compelling reasons to drill down in and start talking more about soil health. So we've been working on this project since 2015 and uh, the pilot projects in Texas are going really strong. Birdwell Clark is one of our ranches down there and uh, they've been incredibly helpful in uh, getting us on the ground and thinking about how to come up with programs that make sense for, for ranchers and for farmers. And we work closely with HMI Holistic Management International uh, as we were starting this and continue to work with them quite a little bit. And what, what we have heard from the producers that we work with is they understand that, and they want us to understand that if we can help them build their soil biology, and if we can help producers do this across the entire nation, we can improve water cycles, which helps us be more resilient to droughts and floods and these I don't know what it did in other parts of Montana, but we were 47 below zero last winter and 113 this summer. And soil biology can help us with that. Of course, it can increase crop and forage production. It, by improving soil health, we also improve plant, animal, and human health through nutrient-dense foods. And you know the bottom line of this, coming back to NCAT's mission, is that we improve the profitability and longevity of agricultural operations. And so when we talk to our funders and our partners, um, what we are really working on is helping, doing our part to help build thriving communities, secure and safe food systems, and a bright future for people and for nature. Because we're in Montana, and thinking about uh, soil for water and this being the last best place for so many um, so many I species of iconic wildlife you know the elk populations that we have the grassland birds this is you know it's a big part of our pride in Montana a lot of our cold water fisheries and it's not just the profitability and longevity of agricultural operations that hinge on helping producers with soil biology. It's this rich natural heritage that we want to carry forward for future generations. And so our program on the ground is very simple. Our mission is to work with people and together we can catch and hold more water in the soil. The way that we do that is we're building a community of, of regenerative farmers, ranchers, gardeners uh, that's nationwide now. We just this last week opened up our pilot. We've gone from our pilot projects in eight states to being nationwide. And we've gone from working exclusively with ranchers to also working with farmers. And uh, we understand that this is very thankfully, a very crowded marketplace right now, people who are working on sustainable agriculture, who are working on building soil biology. And that abundance of, of resources, of partners, of programs, of approaches, just like one of the principles, the five soil health principles is diversity that's what it takes for soil to be healthy. I believe it's also what it takes for this movement of regenerative agriculture to be healthy. And that's partnering wi uh, widely and in innovative ways with anybody else who's doing good work. And so a lot of what we're doing is, um, is building peer-to-peer -peer networks, building learning circles, um, which are related but slightly different. And 
and at all points connecting producers up with, with whatever resources we can scout around and find. And the way that we do that is we are just in the next week uh, going to launch our new website, which will have a regenerative atlas, which is a, a searchable map uh, where, where producers can plant their flag on the map, tell people what they're doing. It's searchable and it's got background layers of hardiness zones and, uh, excuse me, my dog is running a bowl around on the floor. Kelly, <laughs> sorry. Uh, <laughs> they always have to get in the middle of a Zoom call. Um, so the, the Atlas will be searchable away for people to, to connect with one another. We're going to be launching a forum. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the farming forum in Europe or Ag Talk here in the US, but this will be a forum very like that that is built just around regenerative agriculture. Everybody's welcome. Topics are wide open, a wonderful way to connect. We're building a network that has some nice perks in it, um, get some discounts on your soil health testing, uh, access to some of our teachers, partners, and mentors, people such as Gabe Brown, Alan Williams, Alejandro Carrillo, uh, Nicole Masters, Didi Pursehouse, um, David Johnson, Richard Teague. We, we have been blessed with uh, with these great minds agreeing that, that um, we're only gonna conquer this challenge together and we can bring a lot of richness to one another by working together. We have on the ground workshops, we have webinars. Um, you can always call us, my contact information is on here. We've got a team of 10 people nationwide that are working on this. And we would love to hear from you um, as we're developing this, because this is a new program for Montana, and uh, we have such a great um, a great way of doing things here in Montana. Listening to what Michael was just talking about, and knowing what Western Sustainability Exchange and others have done, um, we have the chance to build the program that we want here in Montana, and also to see if we can't have that information flow out and then turn back and, and help our people more as we move forward. So I wanna say thank you for having a chance to talk with you. I'm always happy to try to answer questions um, and I hope that we'll be able to work together. Well, thank you, Linda. The, uh, um, before I open it up to others, is, do you have the, the, the website where is it available? You said it'll be available next week or so that's being launched. Um, uh, can you share that address with folks? Uh, sure, I can do that. Okay. Yeah, it's actually, it's active right now. It just doesn't have, we're just holding the forum and the atlas back. This this atlas okay. is the coolest thing. We're trying to get the plant hardiness zones in there and the Huck 4 watersheds and, and all these things where people will be able to layer down and find people who might have similar issues and and that's taken a little bit of time that technology piece is not my forte <laughs> so i will put that in the in the chat box okay thank you uh, any questions for linda at this point i don't see any right now oh i sorry robin go ahead oh Mark has your hand up and then i can go after more Great job, Linda. Um, so I just want to make sure I understand. So they're working on a program for Montana. So it's not like delineated yet exactly what's going to happen in Montana, or is it going to be just like Texas? Wow. Um, good, good question. And, and I'll bet you know the answer. <laughs> we in Montana don't want to do things just like Texas. This isn't Texas. We can, we can learn from them, they can learn from us, but we're gonna build our own program. And, and what we recognize, and partly through listening in with the soil, uh, you know, the Montana Soil Outreach 
work that we're doing, uh, you know, that we're alongside of with you and Cole. Um, you know, we recognize that even in Montana, there are going to need to be multiple regional approaches to this. It's a very big state with a lot of different issues. Just because it works in one place, it won't work, won't necessarily work here. And and I think that's a big part of <laughs> a big part of the partnership work that we that we need to do. <laughs> Okay, the dog wants to be in charge. Um, is to is to understand how we build this specifically for Montana, and I do really want to see us think about how we can do the interface between what we do for ag and what we do for conservation, because every day that goes along, we see more and more clearly that the way to do conservation is through regenerative agriculture. That's the best path to conservation. And I think that we have an opportunity to, to build that real strongly in Montana. So those pilot projects that you were talking about, are those like demonstration projects on certain ranches? Or give me an example. So maybe there's some ideas that might come for me in Montana, just to get it, get an idea of what you're thinking about. Yeah, when I drop the when I drop our um, website address soilforwater.org in the chat box, you'll see there that we have a list of 16 or 17 stories on the ranches that we've been working on in in uh, Texas. And remember, this is just it's just Texas and it's just ranches at this point in time. But we've been we've been working in Colorado, New Mexico, California, and now we're starting to work in Arkansas, Mississippi, and Virginia. So we're starting to build out those stories a little bit, Marnie. And one of the things I love about this approach is, and it's the same with NRCS, you know, you, you have the local, you have the lo local base, but you also have a national perspective because of who you work for. And I think that NCAD and the Soil for Water Project has that same thing. I get to talk to those folks in those other states and you know, what, what soil health tests are you finding are most um, telling and are what most affordable and which lab do you like and, and uh, questions like that. So, yeah, I encourage you to have a look at those stories and then get back to me because we're going to, we're going to build our very own, very good program here. Outstanding. Thank you, Linda. And uh, so with that, again, there'll be more time for questions later, but let's move on to Marnie and Cole, if you would like to let us know about the Montana Soil Outreach Project. Okay, I'm gonna to try to do the screen share again. All right, can you see this? We can. All right, thanks everybody. Um, yeah, um, Marnie, do you want me to start off and then and then uh, hand it over to you or would you like to start? Go ahead and start, that's Ready? great. Okay. So my name is Cole Mannix, I, I live in Helena and uh, I, began um, helping uh, in the fall of 2020 in advance of the legislative session with a, a bill called SB 180. And that was a bill that would have created a, a study in an interim committee of our legisla le legislature uh, to look at soil in the state and to basically ask the question, is there, is there more that can, that can be done and what more can be done? And um, I was I was hired in that by the Grill Montana Food Policy Coalition. Um, one of our I think important accomplishments in that process was that the Montana Association of Conservation Districts, um, which you know as as I as I think we all know, um, the conservation districts have a long history of that's why they were created for soil, and yet they were not quite in support. They were a bit neutral on the 
on the bill. And by the time we came to the legislative session, they were in full support. And um, I think we sort of saw renewed interest and energy from that organization, from their board, that yes, this soil has never been more important. Uh, and we need to revitalize our, and, and sort of just renew our efforts. And so they were an advocate at, we, we had a lot of conversations across the state with our agricultural groups and with our legislators, with farmers and ranchers. Um, and at the end of the day, the bill did not pass. Um, it failed in the Senate on the Senate floor, 23 to 27. And uh, the effort was still seen as um, not quite mainstream, uh, you know, a little bit left. Um, there were concerns, I think, expressed uh, in particular by the only vocal opponent to the bill, uh, grain growers, that this that, that the study could end up creating things that were redundant, uh, you know, wasting resources, even though it was only going to be a twenty thousand dollar study. And that, you know, what if we have extra resources, why don't we spend them on research and at our state land grant university? Um, and, you know, I think similar concerns were expressed by uh, groups like the Farm Bureau, um, a lot of mainstream, mainstream ag of just, do we really need another program? There's so much going on in soil health in Montana. And anyway, after the session was over though, there was still quite a bit of energy from all the conversations that we had had around soil. And so in April, we convened a group of folks, about, about 17 people on the initial call from the DNRC at the state level, the Department of Ag, NRCS, um, a handful of NGOs, including Grow Montana, and also including a handful of farmers and ranchers, and just said, you know, is there, outside of just a legislative study, is there something we can do? There were some resources already available um, at the state level through DNRC, and um, we decided that there is something that we can do, but we don't want to create a specific program yet. You know, Montana is um, unique and there's a lot of different perspectives on soil and it, it's strange that soil be, can be politicized, but it has been a bit. And it seems like anything can be politicized. And so we just, we decided as a group that we really wanted to reach out across the state, particularly to farmers and ranchers um, with them as a, the practitioners as the focus but with also to other folks who work in soil in, in whatever capacity, whether that's extension or the university, and ask um, what can Montana do at the state level to better support farmers and ranchers in managing soils. And so um, NRCS has provided some funding. Um, we are hopeful that the DNRC will also be providing funding and we'll be finding out shortly and within a couple of weeks and NCAT and the Grow Montana Food Policy Coalition and the Department of Ag and others have provided small, smaller amounts of funding to support what is a year long outreach effort. And we're essentially spending the, the fall of 2021, the, the late summer and fall of 2021, we were shaping the outreach tools, surveys and focus groups. And we're gonna spend this the rest of this fall telling people about that the outreach is happening. Um, if you have your phone handy, you could just bring up your camera and scan this URL code and it'll bring you to this website. We are showing up at as many meetings as possible. We are asking as many folks who have a mailing list um, of folks interested in soil in Montana and asking them to send this URL to them. And then um, people are already take, starting to take um, both a short version, uh, a sort of a short survey and also a longer, more in-depth version. And they're starting to sign up for what will be um, six outreach meetings this coming spring around the state and also virtually where we can engage people in person. We also at this URL have the ability of, folks can just pick up the phone and call with their thoughts. And then in what will, happen at the conclusion is that we will um, work with Crystal Jones and JG Research to gather the data from what people have said on the survey and in the listening sessions and develop a report that includes recommendations for what might be done in Montana um, based on the feedback that we've received. And so this, if I, if I could leave you with one thing, it's that we right now, 
the goal is to share this QR code, this URL as broadly as we possibly can and to maximize participation. Um, the Montana Association of the Conservation Districts, the Montana Watershed Coordination Council and a whole bunch of partners are behind this. Uh, I, I would just call them lead partners, but there has been a great deal of, of help from, from a wide range of folks. And we meet every Tuesday from 1 to 2.30 on open calls that anybody can participate in, to, uh, sort of a steering committee, but it's a fluid group of people. We just call it a working group. And um, we generally have anywhere from 7 to 12 people on that call, people that help to shape the survey questions and the way the surveys you know, ended up being delivered. Uh, like what should the outreach look like? And now those same people are meeting to talk about um, how do we get this URL distributed as widely as we possibly can? Um, and so if anyone on this call is interested in participating in that weekly call, um, uh, please email, uh, email me at exploringsoil at macdnet.org and I'll share my contact information here at the end. And we'd be happy to send you that call information. Um, but at the very least, we would love you to go to that URL and participate in the survey, sign up for a focus group, and share this with whatever um, you know listservs you think might be appropriate. Along the way here, we've you know we've already received a lot of feedback. And some of this is some of this feedback shaped why we're doing this outreach, and some of it is more um, suggestions for you know, at the end of this report, what folks have so far felt is most important to do. So this is a MSU soils professor basically saying that soil acidity in his view is an existential uh, crisis. In another uh, quote, he basically said that on one of our calls, um, really feels that acidity on our cropland is one of our biggest challenges to overcome. Um, this is another Montana farmer, large scale farmer. Um, I think it's worth just sharing this whole quote and I'll just read it. He says, I believe there's such a knowledge gap resulting from years of misinformation that farmers may not even be able to know what they need to change. At this point, if you ask anyone what soil health is, the, the words cover crops will be in their first couple sentences. As much as I think cover crops have some place in soil health practices, they should not have the prominent place they have been given, especially in Montana dryland farming. After lots of time spent studying this, I now believe the main way to increase soil health is to utilize the limited moisture we get by growing better, bigger roots and inoculate them with high quality biological compost extract with the crops we already grow and increase crop diversity and drastically reduce our synthetic fertilizer use so we limit the carbon burn. We need to aim to make our soils more fungal and less bacterial. Um, I believe we should take a real close look at the Johnson Sioux composting method and have demonstrate demonstration sites for it. I, I share this in particular just because it struck me, this person is from one of the organizations, you know, is very involved with one of the org organizations that tends to be a little bit suspicious about soil health efforts and um, certainly tends to be suspicious about what they perceive to be environmental type groups, and yet is very passionate clearly about soils. Doesn't, um, you know, is, is a little bit Question, certainly questions the, the role that cover crops have in dry lawn farming, or at least the, the way in which they're incorporated, but is very passionate. And the, I think one of the most important things about this Montana Soil Health Outreach is that the goal is to depoliticize soil health and really just reach out, ask the practitioners in particular, what more can we do to support ranchers and farmers? Um, and this is a perfect example of somebody who's passionate about it. Here's another MSU soil professor, a different one. Thinking about some of the challenges related to soil health, uh, making sure we capture that in the context of some things that are unique to Montana. You see a lot of information coming from other sources. And one of the things I've encountered in my research is that it doesn't always translate to our context here in Montana and some of the conditions we face. And we have also continued to hear that theme across the board of, if, if we're gonna do more on soils in Montana, it has to be unique to our context. Um, this was a group of ranchers that um, I believe Marnie broached the question with. And you can see, I won't continue just reading the slide, but you can see um, 
a basically educate our bankers <laughs> theme running throughout their feedback. Clearly, you know, crop insurance is a big factor in the decisions people are making, but also the lenders um, are a huge uh, factor that is influencing how people are, the systems people are operating. Um, this is just a quote, I, I won't read it verbatim, but it's, it's, it's uh, one of the folks who leads our agricultural research station saying, we could use the results of this outreach effort to um, go get grant funding that's needed to answer research questions. So if, if folks wanna see more research, um, we can capture those research dollars if we know what folks need and want. And finally, here's a, this woman is a rancher and a conservation district watershed group leader who just sees a lot of value in this effort. I fully support the effort and the intention to assist landowners. I'm not a believer in surveys, and that's why you know some pe people were very suspicious that surveys were a good way to go about this. And so we've tried to provide a little bit of something for everybody, a survey in case you can't come to the, the in-person stuff, you know, in case of COVID doesn't allow us to meet in person. Um, the, you know, you can pick up the phone, you can email us, you can come to the virtual focus group, We've tried to maximize the different ways that people might be able to engage. So this is a way you can contact, uh, you can get to the URL, you can email me if you're interested in being on our weekly calls, you can give me a call and just share your thoughts. And um, from there, I'm just gonna ask Marnie to fill in some of the things that I've missed. Cole, I don't really think you missed very many things. You did good. Um, I work for the NRCS um, and they just recently wrote a Montana soil health strategy and that's all part um, you know, of continuing education or trying to increase the pace and scale of soil health in Montana. So I'm really excited about this outreach effort. Um, I have had the privilege of working in Montana for 25 years and been all over the state working with farmers and ranchers. And it is so cool to see what some of the farmers and ranchers are doing, even in the last five years. I mean, they're really doing some cool stuff with composting, compost tea, making um, you know seed treat with their own compost and some really cool intensive grazing things. So I'm really excited to hear from farmers and ranchers on what they think will help others like them um, or what helped them make that next step. So I'm just excited to work with the group and find out more information that we can increase soil health in Montana. Trying to see here I, how I, there we go. Stop my screen share. Great, thanks folks. So let's open it up to questions. Uh, uh, for any of our, any of our uh, speakers. Ada? Thanks, Rob. Uh, Cole, I have a question for you. Um, I'm just curious if you have thoughts on the role of public lands grazing and soil health in Montana, and if you've been part of any um, discussions about policy change that might enable or support ranchers in managing for soil health on public lands. Um, I'm thinking of things like sort of the idea of outcomes-based grazing authorizations and things things like that. Hi, Ada, it's good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. <laughs> uh, yeah, we haven't, you know, we haven't gone down the path too much, you know, just in Montana yet of discussing what it, where is that one part of the appetite that folks have, but I can, I can say that there is at least one and maybe a couple of the of the BLM outcomes based grazing projects going on in Montana. Um, one is in central Montana near Winnet. And um, in a in my former role with, at Western Landowners Alliance, um, one of our board members was involved in the largest one in Nevada on the wine cup gamble. And, um, you know, certainly see basically, you know, adaptive management is the goal for the ranches and, um, you know, measuring outcomes rather than, you know, pra formulaic practices is the goal from the perspective of, you know, the folks that are overseeing the use of those public lands, and trying to verify that increased flexibility is just as good or better for the resource. Um, 
So I, cer I certainly hear that anecdotally in Montana in different circles, but it hasn't yet come up as, a, as something specific in our in the soil outreach project. Thanks. Mm -hmm. so, so other questions, and actually I think there are few enough people that if you have a question, just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask the question. Linda, go for it. I had a question for Michael. I wonder, um, it seems to me like there's a lot of good work. You've talked about the Tomcat Ranch and Piscine and White Oak Pastures, and they do some marvelous stuff, you know, Apricot Lane Farms. It's also inspiring. And um, the missing piece has always been return on investment, cost of production. Can regular people do this stuff? And how might you get started? And I wondered if there would be a way as you're developing the programs um, there to have that be kind of a focus. And, and if I know it's always uncomfortable to open books on this, but it seems like HMI and Savory are pretty, you know, you're kind of the leaders at it. And it would be such a, such a benefit to people on the ground, you know, farmers and ranchers to be able to see, yeah, that's cool, but what did it cost and what did it get you? Yeah, that's such a good point. That was one of the big parts of our um, Western SARE proposal was that we're going to be tracking and looking at all of the different inputs and outputs. And that's some of the benefit of being part of that open team academy is we have the, we'll have some of that platform um, and several different ways to monitor. So we'll do the EOV, um, the ecological outcome verification that Savory um, offers, and then use open teams kind of tracking and platform to see where we are. And this, we, we feel really lucky that this space has not been like grazed for about 25 years. So we really have a blank slate to start with. We don't even have like, we have no infrastructure up at this site. So we'll have to be creative about fencing and water and there's very low biodiversity. Um, there's a lot of bare soil that we're seeing. So if we are able to transition some of this into healthier lands, we'll, we are absolutely intending to be tracking all of this so that we can share this story um, and then have this be kind of a clear, a, a clear path of what, of what we did and maybe what worked and what didn't work. So that's a great question, yeah. Thank you. I have a, a kind of a question and comment for uh, for the three of you guys that presented here today. Uh, first off, kind of supporting one of the statements that Cole put up uh, for the soil scientists and the need for having a report and a study like this to you know to you know, to leave, put, to hang their hat on, so to speak, and, and you know, uh, go out and get more, you know, do more scientific studies on this is, is um, you know, one thing I think that I see sort of missing in the, uh, in the landscape of soil science and regenerative farming in Montana in particular, and maybe more generally is, is the lack of a sort of a verifiable set of data, you know, that, that, you know, to the question of how can a local farmer, you know, what should I do and what's my ROI and, and, you know, what are my inputs, you know, what, you know, what are some, what are some real numbers and, and how do you, how do you generate this data? Uh, for example, the savory method, you know, there's, it's not without controversy. And, and, you know, some of the controversy is around that, that a lot of this is sort of what I call model free assertions of what is going to happen. Um, it may very well be true. And, and certainly there's a lot of experience that says that, that it is true, but context is everything. And this goes to another point that one of the inputs for Cole made is that, you know, what is the Montana context for, for this? And that's where it's important to have, you know, model-based data. And I wonder if you could all kind of talk to that. Maybe. Yeah, 
I'll, I'll give it a go. <laughs> um, one of the things that we're hoping for, Richard, with our with our forum is that, uh, and with the network, the network was actually built around the idea of a safe place for producers to share their actual um, data and their questions and not worry about someone looking over their shoulder, uh, you know, is PETA watching or, you know, EPA. And so it is, the network is there and it's a safe place for that. But what we really see as our role as a, we see ourselves as a connector and building the ways that we can that we can share data and information partly through that forum and the atlas those are both searchable things so if we've got somebody who's wondering what soil health test is affordable and is going to be the thing that answers my particular question they can either put their question in there they can engage with their learning group um, through the network, or they can they can use the forum once it's up and has some has some ground behind it. They'll be able to use it to research it. You know, you'll be it's a searchable database, and who's talking and and you can private message somebody. Uh, you know, there was a recent study that came out of um, out of Wyoming about about soil health measures that some of us were looking at, and the idea of soil organic. Uh, matter maybe being the most um, the most affordable thing, but is it repeatable and how much do you have to do? And I don't know how else to do that because like you say, it's so context-based. If the answer is this in, in Sydney, is that same answer going to apply in, in uh, Broadus? And we don't know, and we've got to find a way to share the information. And so there's the public way, which is through the forum, where people can look at it, but if people wanted to build that type of information through our networks, um, we're gonna facilitate that. And then we do have, you know, we've got um, Rick Haney is one of the people that we work with with Soil for Water and Nicole Masters, uh, the program leader, the national program leader for Soil for Water is gone for a couple of weeks studying with Nicole Masters right now and we'll be able to provide some of that more information as as we move forward so um, we do not have the answers but we would like to be a place where where we can connect people who are looking for answers and wanting to help Richard there are a couple projects that are are new through NRCS that have um, will eventually have some data. One is in Eastern Montana where they're doing some high stock density grazing um, for three years. And so they'll be doing some soil testing there, um, especially I think on some soil infiltration rates um, and production. They're moving like every few hours on um, 300 acres. And so there will be some data from that. And then I'm working on a project up here um, with mainly farmers and they're doing um, all of the soil health principles on 600 acres. And we are doing soil testing, soil health testing, soil biology testing and aggregate stability testing. We'll be doing those for five or six years. And the goal really is, because a lot of producers that I talk to say, well, how long does it take before we can see you know, results in soil? And, and there is no answer. And so my goal with this project is working with these farmers for five or six years so that after the fifth or sixth year, we can showcase, because they're taking soil samples every year, um, what is happening to the biology, what is happening to infiltration rates um, and soil carbon, you know, the food in the system. So hopefully um, that will give us a little bit of data to start out with to help producers know before they jump into this, you know, I have to know that in five or six years, then I'm going to start seeing the results because in our environment, and like you said, context is everything. Our environment, it takes a little bit longer than in Minnesota and North Dakota where they get more precip. And so that is important. So I'm hoping that, you know, those types of projects will be able to share data um, with, with everybody. We have those soil health workshops. We have a soil health symposium in Billings in February um, 9th and 10th. And there will be some producers that are participating in that actually speaking there. And hopefully, you know, as we go through this, we can have those producers speak at that symposium. We kind of highlight Montana producers every year at those. So 
hopefully that answered some of your questions. <laughs> Richard, I'd, I would just add that, you know, one of the pieces of feedback that I was getting from the egg research stations was if we're going to deploy resources at a large scale in the state, <clears throat> something at some more, some larger scale than we do now, we, we really need to kind of update some kind of an e ecological baseline um, across statewide, you know, and, and that would be such an, an undertaking and an expense that it would, it would really take broad agreement, but it would, you know, it would give us a, a better sense of what the baseline is in each very unique place in the state. And so, you know, that's what, if, if you, if, if you, if something comes of this and if, if some of the feedback from people, if there's enough feedback that says, yes, we need much more resources, we need a, a huge state effort. If that's what we hear, um, certainly from the ag research stations perspective, they would just like to, we need, we need to really bring ourselves current on where, you know, in each landscape on, you know, where these most important metrics are at. Um, you know, there's a, I would call it sort of a citizen science effort that I think is a pretty interesting one in the Winnet area that Bill Milton has been leading for several years now called the Range Monitoring Group, where they are monitoring. Thank you. <laughs> um, so they're, they're doing, they're doing bare ground monitoring. They have a, a, a migratory bird component, they're doing water infiltration, and they're doing, you know, vegetation diversity. And they're, you know, I think I want to say nine to 11 ranches that are working, measuring the same metrics in the same way with the same um, professionals who are helping them. And that's a pretty good grassroots um, effort. It's, it's, it's really challenging. Um, and because, you know, what metrics and what methods and and how do you change midstream if you if you start off on the wrong foot? Uh, and then I'll just one more one more thing I would say about this co-op that I'm involved with. It's called Old Salt Co-op, and there's three founding ranches. And we've been looking with regard to what um, Michael referenced in savory stuff. I mean, we've really been looking hard at EOV as a way to say how do our co-op ranches coordinate so that we are we are we know something about how we're doing compared to last year. And we have some verification of our, you know, of our land ethic where we're actually measuring not, and not just talking about it. And um, so e the EOV system is something we're looking hard at um, just more on the, you know, three folks that are in business together and trying to build a consistent product and verify our claims and also just inform our management on the ranches. So, um, and then the last thing I'll say is that, you know, the data is important and the monitoring is important. And yet, on the other hand, a lot of people so far in the outreach effort are saying, um, you know, you're never going to have uh, a perfect baseline and you're never going to have perfect metrics. And we just need to be able to experiment. <laughs> we need to be able to take risks outside of the norm and try stuff and things like crop insurance make that really hard at any kind of a scale. And so, you know, for them, it comes back to little pools of funding that are perhaps more flexible than a lot of our federal pools, but allow people to buy a new variety of seed and try something pretty different. And, uh, you know, compare what they're YouTubing to, to what, they're, what they actually experience on their place and then compare notes with neighbors. And that's where I think what soil for water become that sort of networking becomes really valuable. Anyway, yeah, that's I like that. I like that too, uh, that term YouTubing. <laughs> yeah, you can get caught up in that tube and get pounded into the reef pretty hard. That's surfing in California, beaches, well, sandbars, not so much reef searching. Certainly. Ada, I think your hand was up next. Thanks, Rob. Um, yeah, I kind of wanted to actually just ask Michael a little bit more about the EOV. Um, I was actually in Roundup just a couple weeks ago with Bill, and he happened to be on a call with the monitoring group, so I got to join. And um, I'm a PhD student right now and looking at kind of how ranchers are managing for drought and climate stressors and 
what kinds of strategies folks are using, um, including monitoring. And so I kind of, I've been interested in EOV um, and I'm wondering, Michael, if you know um, or can tell us a little bit more about how the EOV monitoring and indicators would or could tie into monitoring programs that ranchers already have established. Um, yeah, just a little bit. Um, I want to know a little bit more about that. Yeah, I can speak. I'm not a monitor, so I have not gone through this full training, but I know I know a little bit about how it works functionally. So even even with ranches that are that are in existence currently, um, they usually um, there are regional verifiers that schedule the visits to come out and establish like monitoring sites and they do baseline um, testing for both short term and long term indicators. Um, and then they follow up the next year to see if things have shifted or changed or what, what that's looked like. And there's a set of metrics that Savory uses to determine if a site is, it can be considered EOV certified. And so it's kind of a certification program in that sense. You don't have to be certified, but you can, you can still do um, EOV monitoring even without having to become certified through Savory. And then they come back every fifth year to do that long-term monitoring. Um, and so if the, and if data trends are positive, you can keep your, you get to keep your EOV verification. I don't know if that necessarily answers your question, but that's at least how this works on a very high level, like process forum. Um, all the data is kept for Savory in a, in a massive database. You can click in, um, and you can see results from all over the world, which is pretty fascinating. Um, so you can even see different climates and, and soil types that are similar to Montana. Um, I don't know how much monitoring really has been done here through EOV specifically. Um, my guess is probably not much. I don't know that there's any, that we have any verifiers who live in the state either. That's one thing that we're exploring is if we as a hub want to become certified um, to actually do that work and offer it as a consulting like service essentially to anyone who's interested in it. Um, I can definitely get us connected to the Savory EOV people if that's helpful um, just to have further conversations. I think they can answer more specific questions. Does that provide any input that you're looking for? Yeah, yeah, that does. I, um, I kind of I don't know who, I think it may have been Cole who's mentioning just there's so many different indicators and metrics for, for measuring, um, you know, the health of, you know, soil and sort of a broader landscape. And so it's interesting to me to think about um, how some of these different methods and indicators could uh, work together so that folks can, you know, draw the benefits from things like EOV, where you'd get that land to market uh, labeling and um, things like that. But yeah, I'm interested to know more as the hub um, kind of progresses here in Montana. It's awesome. Yeah. And we also, um, you know, that's one of the reasons we teamed up with Open Team because no, no programmer model is like perfect. And it, we know there's like, have heard there's holes with some of the savory pieces. And so we were curious with Open Team too, like what are other what are other organizations doing? What other indicators are there and how? And their open team is more of like that how. It's like, how do you measure? And they have a huge database that they're starting to put together too. So lots of interest in, in data integrity and methodologies behind, behind that for sure. And Michael, you had your hand up a minute ago. I see it's down. Do you, do you have a question? Uh, no, I think I answered okay. or offered my own thoughts. So that's okay. Great. Marty? I had a question for Michael. I was really excited to hear about your project there because part of the NRCS's soil health strategy, one of the goals was a demonstration farm or ranch to showcase some of the soil health principles. And so maybe there's, we can talk at a later date, maybe there's some things that we could partner with or something. So really excited to hear about that. So the 10 acres, tell me a little bit more what that looks like. Is that all part of native range? and you were just gonna, I didn't quite catch what you were gonna do with the 10 acres. Oh, that's more, that space is what Colin is giving the Weir for the Land Foundation. So that's sort of our spot 
to do, and I, I would like to do some um, food production there, like through greenhousing or some farming and have some smaller livestock in that area. And then the 200 acres is really more for um, cattle range grazing out in that space. Yeah. And we would love to figure out how to make a demonstration space that would work for the NRCS. Like that is absolutely one of our goals is how to partner and create spaces that are um, permanent for people to go. I know that it's so interesting to go um, do the field trips and those are wonderful. And it could also be interesting to have space that is just here year after year for people to come back to and kind of see what's happening in, in that capacity. Oh, the other comment I was going to make is, uh, Cole, you mentioned about not always getting to do um, like trying different techniques and some of the crop insurance. That was exactly the reason why we became a not-for-profit so that we could kind of have that fluidity um, of testing out different like techniques and seeding and like playing a little bit more failing, if you will. Um, and that's definitely, I just thought it was interesting you brought that up because we had a huge conversation about how we were going to structure our, or, our work and our organization. And yeah, that was really one of the reasons we chose that. Mm. Michael, do you mind, uh, when you shared your email earlier, I think it was just with me. Could you share that with everybody? Because it sounds like there's a lot of interest in, uh, in these projects. Uh, so other questions for folks? All right, I, I don't see any hands raised. Um, the, uh, so we get done a little bit early, but I want to thank everybody, uh, all our speakers today is just outstanding. And it, it's both been very inspiring but also it's starting to feel really good. Like we're starting to make more connections. There's a lot of work to be done, but there's a lot of work been being done, but it's been also very siloed. And it sounds, sounds like we're starting to break down some of those silos and, and make the connections that need to happen uh, uh, across the board, not just in soil health, but in others. So Mark. Yeah, just real quick, uh, Rob, I see an icon up on Chelsea's screen. I just wondered if that, if she's uh, raising her hand. Chelsea? Oh, okay. she says no. No. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Well, thank you again. Let's, uh, let's have a hand for all of our speakers today. The, uh, it was just outstanding. And uh, hopefully some, some more connections made today. Um, and, uh, also want to take this opportunity to, to thank everybody for attending, but also would like to have a hand for uh, Robin Kelson, who's been one of the major forces behind this entire expo, not to mention Arrow. So. Thank you, everybody. And uh, Robin, will attendees get a list of links for the uh, Yes, we'll we'll send out the links along with a note when the recording is live. It'll take a couple of days to, for that to happen, uh, okay. but absolutely. And uh, I'm just you know we'll be following up with uh, all three of these groups uh, separately because there's there are different I think there are different ways Arrow can be of assistance and support, and that's what we'd like to do. Uh, and I just want to thank everybody again for hanging in there on a Sunday afternoon. Um, to share so much of your time uh, so that the rest of us can understand what you're doing. Um, it's just amazing work and I'm just delighted to see all of these uh, events happening around the state. Thanks, thanks again for all the work you do. Thanks folks. Thanks everyone. Thanks Errol. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you.